you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here again. It looks like you've adopted me and <laughs> I have adopted you, which is a good uh, collaboration. Uh, welcome to everyone today. How many of you are students? How many of you are researchers? How many of you are librarians? Ah, okay. So since the vice rector is uh, going to be leaving, I will uh, only very briefly mention that um, I will be ending my presentation and maybe you will not be here by saying that it's important that we develop open access policies and that what we, that the University of Cyprus has done great progress in the country as such to develop its national policies. So we will be very happy to see very soon that the University of Cyprus um, is maybe the first uh, Cypriot institution that assumes um, a formal policy to which um, its researchers also comply. You have all the technical um, expertise, all the support from the library to be able to do so. There is a repository. Um, you should let um, this research out. <laughs> so, um, okay, um, and F Pende, Milestone. Okay, thank you. So um, I was asked to make an introduction to open access and uh, present a bit about the current trends. And so I will give you some open access definitions, which we may know, but it's not bad to uh, repeat and secure the, our shared understanding of them. Um, discuss a bit the benefits of open access and some current trends. So what is open access? It's free of charge online provision of scientific information on the internet for lawful reuse. And the important part here is lawful and reuse. It's not I'm throwing things on my personal web page. This is not open access. Open access means that you deposit and you, you allow your research to be accessible to all immediately through the web in a rather structured way in order that it's also uh, preserved um, and easily accessible to others. We mostly, not mostly, mostly mean information, scientific information we mean to publications and research data, and there's a lot of discussion recently about research data, and Martin will be talking specifically about research data. Um, it's quite, quite important um, for, for reuse. It has a tremendous economic value um, as well. But, um, and these are some seminal um, um, sort of uh, um, definitions of open access, the Berlin Declaration, the Budapest Declaration for open access, um, which I invite you to see. But what are the benefits? Access, access, access is of course the first main benefit and it's not self-evident that everyone um, in the world has the ability to access the material. I'm sure Cyprus, scientific information, Cyprus also has the problem that even very rich countries face, which is we're not able to pay for subscriptions. So Harvard is not able to pay for subscriptions. Germany, I mean, so it's, it's a shared problem um, also that addresses the high level, uh, an inordinate increase of, of uh, subscriptions that the big publishers bring uh, uh, to, uh, in the publishing industry. Uh, you can imagine that in a poor country, maybe for example, countries in Africa, how much uh, this is a benefit to them, but as well as to independent researchers, if we should so say. Someone who does not have access to subscriptions cannot afford them. Um, it's very clear now that open access intensifies research, in particular when we're discussing about biosciences, medical sciences, etc., where also speed is of, of uh, importance and paves new paths for research. Um, for example, uh, imagine new types of research that is really machine enabled, for example, semantic research with text and data mining, etc. Um, interdisciplinary research that's fostered through the availability of these open materials is very, very important. Um, it's also clear, and now we have numbers, I mean, a few years back, these were, these were clear benefits at the theoretical level, but we now start having actually evidence to support this, um, these clear benefits. Um, innovation, for example, take uh, open data. This is a very, very important uh, sector. Um, a lot of innovative companies that use the internet are based on the reuse. They base their entire enterprise cycle on reusing openly accessible data um, all over the world. So this is quite, um, quite important, not to speak about, of course, new medicines, et cetera, 
Um, so which also, of course, leads to economic development. And there's numbers there as well. For example, uh, what uh, the turnover is from the National um, Institutes of Meteorology in the United States of releasing openly the research data for public meteorological enterprises. Huge turnover. Um, all the big countries that are um, innovation intensive and enterprise intensive uh, have made their calculations of the input actually to the economy in billions of euros or, or uh, dollars uh, of open accessibility to research information, scientific information and data. Um, it also contributes to social developments by enabling citizens. This is not, um, this is actually very important and, and uh, governments and public bodies are realizing this increasingly. Uh, for example, studies show that PubMed Central, the biggest, uh, let's say, uh, repository, open repository for medical research in the United States, 40% of its accessibility appears to be coming from individuals, from citizens. You can imagine how important this is. We know about discoveries that have been made by individuals by, for example, the 15-year-old who discovered by using Google, only using Google, and openly accessible materials discovered uh, medicine for cancer. Um, a similar, similarly, 15-year-old discovered new galaxies by using openly accessible information. Um, uh, citizens are increasingly becoming involved into projects which we call citizen science. So there is an increased understanding and involvement by the citizenry in you know, science education. It's very, very important, um, especially with research that's funded for research that's funded with uh, public money. Um, overall, it's more transparent system of scholarly communication. So this openness, and actually later I'll just be hinting to it, um, that open access to publications and data, for example, are part of a wider, wider context of what we call open science, and even a wider one of openness and, and a, um, a, a very sustained um, requirement by researchers and citizens alike to greater transparency in the entire research process. So open access does render this process more transparent than has been done thus far and broadens the participation to the research process. Specifically with regard to publications and data, it's very clear now that at least at now, um, open access to publication and data as a, as a, as a system um, is much cheaper than the subscription-based system that um, holds now. So there is studies to show uh, exactly how much cheaper an article is that uh, is being published open in open access than what we, the costs of an article in a subscription journal. So what I mean to say here is that although open access is free for the end user, of course, when you're talking about publications, infrastructures, it's not cost-free overall, it costs. But it seems that, it, at least with current numbers, it costs less than we're paying for subscriptions. Also, um, the institutions um, that are very involved in it um, have now you know, specific numbers and can control better uh, the costs than you can control now with the subscription system where it's the publishers uh, who, with rather non-transparent procedures, charge you, especially if we're talking about the big corporate publishers, um, charge a lot of money. So there, there needs, the, the system needs to stabilize basically uh, f a bit further down, which of course big publishers will not do. So it's, the, it's a new responsibility for institutions and for funders actually uh, on how to provide access to the, to the research that they fund, to provide open access to it and to be at better grasps in terms of negotiating with publishers the money that we give out. So this is a fair system and a less costly system as it looks now. And just to mention to you that um, what's going on now is that countries such as Germany, um, Austria, and, uh, and the Netherlands are in very heavy negotiations with the big publishers to flip the entire subscription system into an open access system where you pay up front from public, for publications, the institutions do, but at much lower costs, which of course publishers do not want. Nonetheless, it appears, for example, that the Dutch are, are, are willing to go as far as not having subscri subscriptions at all for the Dutch universities. So they're, they're very, very intense uh, negotiations to, you know, for them to lower their prices. Their profit margins are incredible. 
um, in the past few years, I mean, uh, bigger than in pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry, for example, so it's quite not fair for the universities. Uh, that now with open access and the enabling technology do have uh, a bigger role to play and a bigger responsibility um, as to where they spend their money. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, overall, especially for public funders, it's very clear that open access provides a return on the investment and there is a clear realization now that publicly funded money should be openly, um, research should be openly accessible to everyone. You should not pay again to access it in subscriptions. So this has led to a, a slew of policies, and this, I will be talking about this at the end, of mandatory policies for open access. If I'm an author, I mean, what's in it for me? It's very clear that open access makes my work more visible. There's study to show that um, it raises the impact factor, which is this cute way that we measure impact by. Uh, but it does that, um, and it's, it's very clear. It helps preservation, so open access, again, um, in a structured way, and we will talk about this, not just throwing my things in my web page. This is not open access. Um, it encourages collaborative work and helps me develop new research connections across the world. You can, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, the sky is the limit for that. And of course, at the point that we've reached, there's some researchers that cannot work without open access, either because they cannot pay, their country cannot pay, but also because they do such intensive um, machine research and semantic work research that they really rely, for example, there's researchers, let's say, who um, use machines to, and use research data, open data, to test algorithms. If this data is not there, they cannot do their work. So you see that the, the progress is such that it's, it's actually necessary for some researchers. What's in it for me, the university, if I'm a university rector or vice rector? Um, open access clearly aligns with my mission, part of which is widely to share the research produced by my institution, and this is very, very important, important not to forget. Uh, the dissemination and the accessibility of my research to the outside world. Um, definitely the higher accessibility of my researchers' work, which is clear now through open access, reflects on the prestige and on the, um, you know, on the institution itself. So this is theoretically something that the top management should um, desire. Um, through a, an open access repository, if I have one, and the university here has one, I can manage my research, I can preserve it, I can showcase it, the, the, the institutional repository is effectively the, the live museum of the, of the research output of the institution. It's very, very important and can, you know, it can make your institution look good. You can have everything in one place to manage, preserve, and provide access to. Um, if I'm a researcher, how can I provide access to my work? Basically, there's two main ways. One is I can publish in open access. And the second is I can self-archive my work in the repository. And these are two different things, although we will say that self-archiving provides you with new, um, um, new possibilities also. So the gold route is, you know, you, you all know it is the same thing that we do when we publish with, um, um, with, a, with a tall, with a tall uh, um, a journal, so you publish, your publication goes through peer review, but at the end is freely available to the users on the internet. And this is an open access journal, an open access book series, whatever it is. The copyright is usually retained by the authors, and um, actually, yeah, but, but open access is provided. Um, you should know that some open access publishers may charge article processing charges, and these are the big commercial publishers, Elsevier and such. Um, and, and most charge also book processing charges for, for open access to books. Um, you can find open access journals in the directory of open access journals if you don't know where, where to find an open access journals to publish, and open access monographs at the uh, directory of open access books and publishers who publish in open access if you wish to publish there. Self-archiving is to deposit your accepted manuscript of publication into your institutional repository or a subject-based repository. The institutional repository is what your institution maintains for the researchers. Um, and the subject-based repository is a repository um, that is discipline-oriented and uh, not all disciplines have repositories and it's clear, of course, here that also there's a different approach by different disciplines towards open access. Some 
disciplines are very open and have been so from the beginning. Physics, for example. These people just, they share their preprints, the, their, their working papers before they're published. Archaeologists, mm, not so much. So <laughs> we don't, for example, have a, that I know of, we have, a, we have a repository for research data in archaeology, but not for publications, say, in archaeology. But we have one for physics and mathematics and various other disciplines. So, but to be able to, to deposit your, your publications or your research data in a repository, and research data repositories are rather specific. Again, they're usually discipline specific because research data is so particular to its discipline. Every discipline uh, you know, has a different approach to, to data. Con different things are considered data in different disciplines. For example, in archaeology, it might be um, excavation material. It could also be, in literature, a collection of, uh, of texts. Uh, on the other hand, in medicine, it could be genome sequences, whatever. So it's, v it's very different. So you need, uh, it's more useful to deposit data in a subject-based repository that is um, 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 sort of acknowledged as such um, as an important place to deposit by the, by the scientific community. That is more common. So, um, but you must have enough rights to deposit your, uh, your publications or data into these repositories and provide open access, which in turn means that you cannot sign, you should not sign away your rights, all your rights to the publishers. Uh, if you wish to discover where, you know, if your uh, university has a repository or what, you go to the Directory of Open Access Repositories, Open Door, um, or the Open Access to Research uh, Data Registry. Um, and then if you want access to specifically to, to content that comes from repositories, CORE is a project in the UK that brings in a portal um, for, uh, for, you know, uh, good searches into repository materials. I, will, I think there, there's a discussion, there will be a discussion on copyright, but it's very, very important to license your work when we're talking about lawful um, uh, reuse of materials, when you just um, put your things on the internet, even in the repository, and repositories are famously um, lagging behind in terms of licensing. I guess this is gradually being fixed, but it's very important to provide license to your work because this shows to the end user and to machines, for someone who's doing machine-aided research, what they can do and what they cannot do. So it's important um, to use licenses, and Creative Commons is the most important, uh, the best known, rather, uh, licensing scheme which has been legalized in many uh, countries in the world, and we'll talk later about this. But um, to put things on the internet without, even the repository, without license is a problem. It renders your material practically less usable. Um, and uh, so, please do um, use it, uh, licenses. So it appears overall that open access is here to stay, both as a publishing model, but also um, as, uh, you know, self-archiving. And we should say that repositories, we just mentioned the institutional repositories and the subject-based repositories, they provide new, whole new opportunities for different publishing models. For example, imagine a repository where you deposit your work uh, then you invite other people through a peer reviewing tool to peer review your work in the repository. Is this a publication or not? If you start then measuring um, with uh, this whole new way of measuring what we call alt metrics, uh, your, um, your work then, you may have a publication. I mean, if, you're, if your peers suggest that this is good and there's a way to designate an item as published in the repository, then the repositories can also become publication venues. So you see, again, the sky is the limit here. Just briefly to mention that, that, that open access is just a part of a much wider conversation. Now the discussions are about open science, which means basically providing transparency and openness in the entire research process. So from m opening up your methodologies, your software, using open software, uh, open peer review, and peer review has um, famous, famous problems. I mean, it's usually blind, but uh, um, it's, not, it's not a transparent, has not been a very transparent process thus far. Um, using open metrics, publishing in open access venues. So if you think of the entire cycle of research, um, openness and transparency in this entire cycle is what we call open science. 
But at the same time, you have the same movement for culture, for example, for opening up cultural materials. Um, great movement, and, and, and in this, of course, there's, uh, there's European directives for open government data and public sector information that has to be open to everyone. So, so it's only a part in a wider spectrum of, um, uh, of, uh, of movements and, and policies that require openness, um, not only in science, but in the entire cultural production, I guess, of oh, all this is how it will be viewed as in the future. So just some numbers, um, an estimated 40% of all publications are open. This is a rather probably um, uh, optimistic uh, <laughs> uh, calculation, uh, which includes internet pages and everything. But if we, if we define open access, as I mentioned, in a little bit stricter sense, it's really much less. If we talk about you know, good structured publications and repository work, it's close to 20%, maybe even less. Some countries have done measurements. It's, it can be less than that. There is a dramatic increase in open access journals, and open access publishing is now about, I think, 13%, if I remember correctly, of the share of, public, of academic publishing, and this is gradually growing. So DOAJ, the director of open access journals, lists 10,000 journals in an ever-growing rate. Um, the repositories, it's about 3,000 uh, institutional and subject repositories all over the world now. And of course, increasing policies, which is what I will end with. And so here I'm showing you just the recent um, grab of uh, the Open uh, Door database, uh, which is the registry, main registry used for, to, for open access repositories. It's 2000, yeah, 2901 repositories as of yesterday across the globe. Um, and the policies here, um, you can see a tremendous also increase in policies. Roar map is um, a tool that registers the policies uh, across the world. So when Cyprus develops uh, its uh, national policy, which is on the way of doing, and institutional policies, they should be registered in Roar map so that everybody knows what Cyprus is doing and uh, help uh, get us evidence, uh, you know, evidence-based, uh, you know, number-based uh, arguments. Uh, you, and you can see that it's mostly research institutions. Of course, there are more than funders that are, are going that way. Uh, you can also see that it's mostly uh, uh, the wider the European continent that has most of the policies. And this is a recent work that we did with the project uh, that I direct, Pastor for Open Access, which is, uh, helps support policy development in various countries uh, that most... Uh, um, policies are in Europe. So, so I will stick a bit with the research developments in policies. So again, as I said earlier, the benefits of open access to research is well understood now by most funders and institutions. So policies are increasingly being adopted for peer-reviewed publications and research data by funders. So the most important funders in the world now mandate open access. This means that they require it and it's obligatory. So uh, we have now what we call the second generation of policies, initially these were recommendations, but now it's, it's very clear that if you don't make it um, a requirement, and a rather strict requirement, which means if you don't comply, you're not getting any more funding, um, um, it doesn't quite work. So, I mean, all the research councils in the UK, uh, the HEFKI in the UK, which provides funding, evaluates the universities every five years, is there a four or five years, and so open access through repositories is mandatory and the evaluation of the institutions, not of the individual researchers. And this is of interest for the policymakers. So when you bring all the burden to the researcher, it may be a problem for the high policymaker. You render the institution responsible that then renders also the researcher responsible. So, so the institutions are evaluating on the, and, the, and, and their funding is dependent on that. Um, quite important, and all over Europe, the same thing is happening, and in the United States, all the funding agencies in the United States have mandatory open access policies with compliance uh, uh, monitoring. Research institutions, the same. Not only do they recommend, but also they mandate and require open access, and they do this, and we will talk this more about in the uh, policy session, in the, um, um, by linking it to, um, to evaluation. Again, um, it, we have seen, and we've seen this through this project, Pastor, that if you don't link it to evaluation, only about 20% uh, 
of your publications, you can expect to, to land in the repository. Um, if not, you can be expected to hunt the, the researchers to deposit the work. So the best thing is to connect it to, um, uh, to evaluation process. So, um, so this is what is happening uh, all over the world. And um, again, this is the project that we have, and I will speak later about it, that, that sort of fosters the uh, development of such policies which are aligned uh, with the European recommendations, and only very sh briefly, um, I will talk about Horizon and just a little bit about the publications, because I think Martin will talk about the research data. But, op but these policies, this uh, open access to publication is now mandatory in Horizon 2020, and this is the last of actions taken by the European Commission in a series of policy uh, activities towards open access that begin roughly around 2000. Open access and free circulation of of research and ideas is already um, in the Lisbon Treaty. It is in the European Research Area document, which is in 2000 or 2002, somewhere there. So then there is a recommendation, and then there is another recommendation in 2012 that says all member states need to develop policies for open access to publicly funded research, and all institutions need to develop policies and infrastructures as well to provide open access to, um, to publications and research data funded with public funding. So this is the process that Cyprus is finding itself in now, and it's, it's, it's great to, to, to witness this, this process. So what does it require? It requires open access for all peer-reviewed publications in repositories. So it requires what we call green open access. Um, and they should be deposited at publication and should become open. So the metadata should be immediately visible. And they should require, uh, they should become open at the latest six months or 12 months after publication for social science and humanities. And this, as you can understand, is a pressure on the big publishers who require much longer embargoes of up to two years. This is no longer acceptable. And it is the research funders and the top policymakers that can exert this pressure to the publishers. Um, it mandates also open access for research data in seven specific areas of the working program in 2014 and 15, which is called the Open Access to Research Data Pilot, which again must be deposited and open in repositories in a specific way and linked to publications at publication time. The linking of the research data and the publication is a very important thing, and the idea for the openness of the data, especially data that supports publications is, of course, to be able to verify this publication. If you really think about it and actually uh, replicate and, and reach the same conclusions, if you wish, uh, if you think about it, uh, it is rather unethical to make arguments um, um, about something and not release uh, the data sources on which others will be able to check you. So um, this is what uh, it uh, requires. It renders open access charges eligible and other charges relating to data management eligible. Um, so again, all the funders and institutions that require open access to publications or data then have some um, support and financial support. Making this uh, openness happen is part of a requirement, but it should also be financed. So more information on the Horizon 2020 you can find here. And for Greek, in Greek, uh, our web is the penultimate section. Um, we have this website on open access, but for our Greek audience here, uh, if you wish, uh, we have uh, specific fact sheets on what to do. I'm not going to go into what you need to do. But we have one-pagers and frequently asked questions in Greek. Uh, for those of you who work with your researchers, it's a big blue box, open access GR in Horizon. So you go in there, and if they need more uh, information and concise information, what they need to do, one, two, three, this is, I think it's, it's worked quite well. And of course, through Open Air, uh, which is a, uh, a project that is funded to support this policy by the EU uh, and provides support to researchers. The University of Cyprus is part of, um, of Open Air, as well as a, um, a pan-European repository through which this research can be accessed. And we will hear more about this. So this is what I wanted to say as an introduction. I thank you. I don't know if there's questions, if you can take questions or not. At the end, okay, all right, thank you.